And I have said uh, before, and, and I would repeat it again, if it's not going to zero, it's going to a million. It's, it, it's either nothing, right? If it's nothing, then it's getting scrubbed out and banned. Uh, and of course, we now know that it's not getting banned, right? <laughs> There's no way that Fidelity, Citadel, BlackRock, Charles Schwab, Deutsche Bank, Credit Agricole, Banco Santander, all decide they're interested in this, right? They're, they're not endorsing a tulip bulb, right? So once you go from zero to one, then the question is, okay, well, it's an asset class. If it's not going away, then what's it worth? Well, it's worth 1% of the assets in the world. So 1% drives it up by a factor of 10 to 20, right? Once you get to a 1% exposure. So the recognition as an asset class is a big deal. The, rec the, the availability of a spot ETF is a big deal. The, um, you know, the normalization of accounting via fair value accounting, which is the FASB initiative, it's another big deal. And then the halving, right, in less than a year is a big deal. So those are four pretty serious milestones that we're staring at right now. And I think, you know, Wall Street and general and the general community is is kind of just internalizing this all in a short period of time. And that's why the bullish outlook. If it's not going to zero, it's going to one million. That's the message out from Michael Saylor. Michael Saylor believes the future is clear. With the nod of approval from the world's biggest institutions and now the SEC, Bitcoin has well and truly moved past the point where it will go to zero. And if it's not going to zero, that just leaves one question. Just how much is it worth? In this interview, Michael Saylor breaks down why in his eyes, Bitcoin is worth at least 1% of the wealth in the world. As the biggest energy network on the planet, Saylor believes at a minimum it's worth that much. And that would make one Bitcoin worth $1 million per coin. Make sure to stick around to the end of the video where Sailor breaks down why Bitcoin is the key to taking control of your financial destiny. Also guys, only a small percentage of my viewers are actually subscribed. If you enjoy finance content, consider subscribing. It's free and you can always change your mind. Now here's Michael Saylor on why Bitcoin is going to $1 million per coin. So you're a normal person and you want to save money for retirement or to give to your kids. So you put it in a savings account you get 5% interest. The monetary inflation rate is seven or eight or 9%. You've got a negative real yield of 3%. If you end up with a negative year, real yield of three and a half percent, then over a hundred years, a million dollars saved is worth $30,000. Okay. It's it. And so for the average person, saving money in bonds with a three and a half percent or four percent interest rate when the when the currency expands at seven or eight that's a losing proposition you lose 97 percent of your wealth over the course of three generations so clearly bonds don't they don't work right that that and savings accounts don't work so the next question is well, do i just put all my excess money in the s p index well, traditionally, the money supply in the U.S. is expanding at 7% and the S&P index is going up at 7%. So if you save a million dollars over the course of your life and you put it all in the S&P index, then in 100 years, it'll be worth a million dollars. So that's wealth preservation. But you're not doing any better than that. And that just kind of assumes that um, that the S&P 500 is going to be relevant for 100 years and you can stick around the country. But it's it's like treading water. The next issue is, well, so what I put in real estate, if you buy real estate, you're an average person. Can you buy a building? Probably not. Can you buy a warehouse? Not easy. Maybe if you're a rich family, you buy warehouses, right? Rich families uh, buy warehouses, city blocks and buildings, but the middle class person doesn't. So how do you buy um, $4,000 worth of a building? can't okay so the issue there is uh your property rights are inferior when you're buying shares of stock or a security versus the underlying property if you own the building you can mortgage the building sell the building upgrade the building you know build 10 floors above the parking lot that the building has you can develop the building 
when you uh, own a share in a REIT that owns the building, like you own one one hundredth of the building, you don't have any of those rights. You can't do anything to the building. You're just along for the ride, getting one one hundredth of whatever cash flow the general partner decides to distribute to you. And if they make stupid decisions, you're stuck with them, right? You you don't have any property rights. You're you're uh, inferior in your economic rights. So. So owning shares of a REIT to get property for 100 years, not a great idea. And that, that leads us to the problem of securities. What is the problem of security? So you have some money, you invest it in Apple stock or Amazon or Facebook or Google or, or a REIT that owns a building. Um, the dilutive problem with securities is there, uh, the, there are risk factors. First of all, there's a management team. They're going to take 1% every year. They're just going to, they're not doing it for free. They're charging you to manage the company or the building, right? And if you're lucky, that's only 1%. You want to see that in action? Just go look at any ETF. The ETFs charge 90 basis points. You know, if you want to put money into a, a Bitcoin, Beto or whatever, they'll charge you 90 basis points just as the management fee. So about 1%. What's the cost of 1% over the course of um, a lifetime? The uh, an infinite duration asset, you would basically multiply it by 20, 25. So it means that when I charge you 1% to manage your million bucks, I'm taking 20% of your money. Okay. I'm taking 20% of all your wealth to charge you 1%. So that's only the first problem. Um, it turns out that when you run a company, you also have, <clears throat> you have the risk of labor, right? Your company may unionize. So you've got labor expenses and and what happens to the equity value when the company unionizes? Well, the union just takes all the profits and the equity values of, of those companies start to trend towards zero. So labor is another risk. The third risk is your competitors, right? Your competitor may come up with a better product and you end up like Yahoo squeezed out or AOL squeezed out by Google. Well, then your stock's going to zero, right? I mean, how many companies actually had a competitor? Xerox, Kodak, world's full of great companies. Where are they today? They end up getting squeezed by competition. The fourth issue is technology, right? That the, you may just get obsolesced, right? Maybe you own natural gas fields or oil fields and someone creates nuclear power plants and they don't need your oil anymore. Or maybe you sell the world's greatest chemical cameras and people don't need, need cameras anymore. They have digital cameras. <laughs> Right. There, there's always that kind of risk from technology. And then there's execution. Maybe you just don't ship the iPhone 47 to be that good. Right. Maybe the iPhone 13 is good and the iPhone 15 is not good. Right. And, you know, and the world's full of examples of that, like Firestone tires or something. And I ship a tire and the tire blows out. And now people stop buying my tire or, or new Coke. Remember new Coke is a product launch that didn't work out well. So when you're when you're investing in a company, you're not just getting a pure investment. You're actually getting an investment in an asset, but you're getting hammered and diluted by force majeure, by you know bad weather. Yeah, you might get a war. You might get a tariff or a trade war. Like we just decided to put a tariff of twenty percent on all Chinese imports. Oops! If you had a factory in China, what happened there? And then maybe you get a real war, where someone just impounds your ship or blows up your factory. That happens too. We have real wars all the, all the time. So what's the, uh, what's the return on the S and P index? 7% a year. What's the mon monetary inflation rate? 7%. What's really happening? Well, all these companies, they're just barely holding their wealth. And so what would happen if I got rid of all those risks? What if I had, um, what if I could buy a product that was never going to obsolesce, that's good for a million years? What if there was no management team and they work for free, right? What if the product is run by computer programs that don't charge a fee? What if there's no labor? What if it's a digital product? So there is no chance to, to block it via a trade war or destroy it by a real war. What if it was an indestructible, immortal, incorruptible product? Well, when you buy a Bitcoin, you're buying 121 millionth of all the money on the network or all the money in the world that's ever going to be on that network. Okay, so would you want to own 121 millionth of all the money in the world in 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years? 
the product's not obsolescing. It's one twenty one millionth of everything. You see, the iPhone will obsolesce. One day you will, you'll be using Apple Vision or maybe they'll put a telepathic implant in your brain and you won't need phones and you won't need goggles. And maybe you won't need televisions. Those things can obsolesce. But will you want one twenty one millionth of all the energy in the human race? Probably <laughs> like the whole point of pure energy, right? Einstein said energy can neither be destroyed nor created. You can just transform it, right? It's a pure idea. And it's and it's a it's an idea that doesn't have competition because of the immaculate conception. There's one Bitcoin. There's one network that was created by uh, a nameless anonymous figure, Satoshi. Uh, and Satoshi gave gifted a million coins to the universe. Never ran an ICO. Never did a uh, never kept anything from a pre mine. And the network now is just owned by the people. So. How do you actually compete with that? Uh, you know, it's 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 hard to see how you compete with a pure thing like that. So it's a digital monopoly with no labor risk, no war risk, no product risk, no execution risk. Now, there is execution risk that that uh, takes place. So you have to set up Bitcoin miners. And if you set up a Bitcoin miner in China and they shut down Bitcoin mining, the miners lose money. But you don't lose money as the holder. Right. So. It's like the perfect monetary franchise. All of the work to improve Bitcoin is done by the miners, by the Bitcoin device builders, by the Bitcoin banks. Right? You know, BlockFi and Celsius can fail, but if you're holding Bitcoin in cold storage, you don't fail. Right? The, the hardware company can fail, but you don't fail. And so if you study business, uh, what you, let's take McDonald's. Uh, McDonald's is a great business, but but the reason they're a great business is so they don't really take that much risk. All the franchises take the risk. And so it's possible for every restaurant to lose money in the McDonald's chain and the McDonald's corporation still makes money. Because they've uh, laid off that risk downstream, other people risk their capital. So Bitcoin is kind of like this viral ultimate banking monetary franchise where Banks will take risk, miners will take risk, individuals will take risk, companies will take risk. When the risks pay off, the Bitcoin holders benefit. And when the risks don't pay off, the people that took the risk uh, pay the price, but, the, but Bitcoin just continues. It's very anti-fragile. So coming back to your, to your question, right? Well, how's the, the middle class family benefit from this? Well, Bitcoin represents pure digital property, global property. It doesn't have the dilutive elements of a security. It doesn't have the dilutive elements of a currency or a credit instrument or debt instrument. It doesn't have the dilutive elements of property, right? You want to own, you want to buy a, a second apartment in Airbnb. Okay, well, fine. You know, someone may come move into it and trash it. You may have um, a, a renter that doesn't pay the bill. You may get rent controlled by the city. You may actually have a tornado hit it and trash it. You'll probably get a property tax on it from the city, maybe from the county, maybe from the state, maybe from the government. If you ever have to leave, you can't take it with you. And, uh, and at some point uh, in 100 years, the thing is probably going to have to be completely rebuilt and renovated to be usable again. So property is not a great long term store of value. Credit's not a great long term for long term store of value. They're not scalable. You can't buy four hundred and thirty seven dollars of an Airbnb apartment every two weeks. So Bitcoin offers you apex global property. Theoretically, you know, if the S&P index yields 7%, there's no reason why Bitcoin shouldn't appreciate about 14% in that environment. I think you get about a 7% real yield over the course of 100 years, whereas S&P index gives you 0% real yield. The best you can theoretically do with, with real estate property is maybe a 2% real yield if you're just really good at it. But there are just so many risks, you know, will your grandson or granddaughter be able to run the family property portfolio no matter what country they live in? And are you sure? 
that any of 10,000 politicians aren't going to pass a law to destroy your property values sometime in the next 100 years? Think back from 1900 to the year 2000. And now imagine that you own a bar of gold in the bank in your city. What's the likelihood that you still have it 100 years later? Imagine you have um, a building in a major city in the world. Imagine you still have it 100 years later. Would you want to own a building in Russia, in Moscow, in Kiev, in Tokyo, in London, in Paris, in New York? Where would you want to own the building? Where would you want to own the bar of gold? It turns out that everywhere in the world, the gold got seized. Maybe you might have got by in Zurich, Switzerland, but everywhere else you lost all your money. Every bank failed. Every currency failed. <laughs> You know, so your best bet is maybe you own property that they can't make more of if you're lucky enough to own. If you owned a, a piece of property on the Gold Coast of Florida for 100 years, it went from $100,000 to $50 million. Good. But the property taxes on it probably offset the capital gain from it if it was residential. So the only way you could have actually made money owning property is if you own commercial real estate and you generated a rent on it in excess of the taxes and the insurance and the depreciation and the maintenance. It's not easy, not easy to do that everywhere in the world. So, so Bitcoin represents property rights or the right to purchase perfect property that is uh, maintainable, right? It's low cost to maintain. It's not, it's indestructible. You know, the rain doesn't melt it, tornadoes don't destroy it, and uh, and it's scalable. You can buy it with your weekly paycheck, and if it's, it's liquid, uh, you can sell it. Try selling it uh, one one hundredth of a building. Not so easy. <laughs> you want to mortgage the building? Well, you can, a building in Kansas City, you could mortgage to a bank that deals in Kansas City real estate, but if you're Turkish and you have a building in Istanbul, there's only a, just a small number of banks in the world that will give you a mortgage on that. The mortgage will be in lira. The lira is losing 30 to 40% of its value a year. you got a problem. So Bitcoin represents global digital property. You can take it anywhere on earth. You can hold it for 100 years. In theory, you can hold it for 1,000 years. So you can take a very long view and um, how many how many banks will want your Bitcoin? Well, you see what's going on right now is there's a French bank that wants to custody Bitcoin. There's a German bank that wants to custody Bitcoin. There's a Singapore bank that wants to custody Bitcoin. The banks in the UAE are getting into the business. The banks in Spain are getting into the business. The banks in the US are getting into the business, right? And uh, on the other hand, none of those banks want to give you a mortgage on your house in Arkansas. Only, only a local bank in Arkansas is going to get into that, right? So, so Bitcoin represents pure, a, a pure economic asset. It doesn't have the liabilities that come with securities and other forms of property and other commodities. And it's simple. And that's why it appeals to the middle class. I, I, don't, I, I don't have a better solution for you if you're uh, a working a working person on a salary and you want to take control of your own uh, economic destiny. So there's Michael Saylor with a deep dive into the high stakes world of Bitcoin and its potential to redefine our financial landscape. From its endorsement by top tier institutions to the nod of approval from the SEC, we've journeyed through the rationale behind the bold assertion that Bitcoin isn't just surviving, it's thriving, with a trajectory that could skyrocket its value to $1 million per coin. As we wrap up this session, it's crucial to reflect on Saylor's perspective. Bitcoin isn't merely a digital asset, it's a transformative force in the global economy, representing a minimum of 1% of the world's wealth. This isn't about numbers on a screen, it's about the potential reshaping of wealth distribution and financial autonomy in an increasingly digital era. Embrace the knowledge, stay informed, and make decisions that align with your vision for the future. 
Before you click away, a gentle reminder, if this conversation resonated with you, if it sparked a thought or a new perspective, consider hitting that subscribe button. Anyway guys, hope you all enjoyed today's video and that provided you with some value. I'll see you all in the next one and as always, all the best.